Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and I am thrilled to introduce you to Marie White, author of Strength for Parents of Missing Children, Surviving Divorce, Abduction, Runaways, and Foster Care. Marie was born to write, but it would take one horrific event to send her into full-time writing. When her youngest child was abducted, her world turned upside down. Grieving with her husband and older children, she wondered how God could allow this to happen. Yet, in the sea of pain, her family witnessed God's unending love and purpose. She began praying about what to do with her life. The answer to her prayer was a podcast announcement that missionaries were needed. Marie trained and became a missionary with Global Media Outreach. Within the first few months, she had spoken with over 300 converts to Christianity in countries all over the world. Marie's next project began as a how-to for families trying to survive the loss of a child through abduction, divorce, running away, or being taken into foster care. The book evolved into something bigger as she started to reach out to other parents and experts in the field of grief, alienation, loss, reunification, and private investigation. The result is a comprehensive survival guide for parents with children missing from their life. Strength for parents of missing children, Surviving divorce, abduction, runaways, and foster care provides insight and direction for anyone going through hard times and looking for answers. Here to discuss strength for parents of missing children is number one best-selling author, Marie White. Marie, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Eric. I'm so excited to be here. Marie, um, we are the ones who are excited and honored and humbled that you would share your story with us. Uh, our hearts go out to you and to the two million families I had no idea uh, that there are two million families who have experienced a missing child. And I am speechless. And as somebody who has been in talk radio <laughs> and talk television since the 70s, for me to tell you that I have no words to express other than we love you and we stand with you, and we affirm in every way possible getting out the message that says that you may be the one <clears throat> who is going to come across some tip, some way, some picture, some information, something that is going to trigger the reunification of a family. And that is the purpose and the message that we're trying to bring out. Marie, your journey began long ago uh, as a young child uh, being influenced in uh, a home, whether it was a faith-based home or not a faith-based home, but somehow or other God came into your life in a profound way. How did that happen for you? Well, it's actually a really funny story because both my husband and I did not grow up in Christian homes. We both grew up in wonderful, moral, loving homes, you know, great families, but neither of us were raised as believers. Um, my parents loved the fact that there was free child care on Sunday mornings by sending us with two quarters down to the, whatever local church was in whatever town we lived in. So we got exposed to the gospel by going to Sunday school as kids. Um, my husband's parents did not. They did not send him anywhere. So he had never been in a church when we got married. Um, I knew who Christ was. I knew I had been to vacation Bible schools, one of those, you know, unchurched families or un, um, unchristian families who went to vacation Bible school. So I knew who Christ was, but I knew I wasn't living for Christ. And so I had not accepted him as an adult. If I did as a child, I don't remember. If maybe at a vacation Bible school or something, I don't remember that. But my husband and I got married and he, we were both in the military. He actually went to Vegas to go um, on a short term, um, a TDY, which is a temporary duty assignment. He went there and his roommate introduced him to Christ and he came home and said, you need to accept Christ. So, so we were both adults. And so because he said that you did it? No, oh my gosh. Like I was like, you don't know what you're talking about. Like I know who Jesus is. I know I'm not worthy. You know, that that's just, um, you know, no, that's, I'm glad for you, but no, that's not for me. And it took three days of him just constantly, you know, you need to accept Christ. You need to, I'm going to be in heaven. I want you to be with me. You know, I need you to accept Christ. And I fought it and fought it. And finally, one day, 
doing the laundry, I just remember holding the basket and just saying, Lord, you know who I am and you know I'm not worthy. But if you'll accept me, I'll have you in my life. And that started a whole incredible journey. So from there, what took place in your life? How did your life and his life change? It took a while. We wanted to start going to church at that point, but we lived in a very small town and there were probably two churches there and <laughs> neither of them. We went to visit them and both of them were a little weird for us. So um, we ended up moving and then finding a larger church, more of a seeker type church that we started going to uh, a few years later. And it just took a little while. But once the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you, I mean, that growth process just growing exponentially. So you prayed, you heard a podcast about um, missionaries, and this was after the abduction of your child. Yeah, about 20 years later, yeah, 15 years, I guess, maybe later after we accepted Christ, you know, had our children, you know, we're raising them in the church, just, you know, led Bible studies and all this stuff. Um, did this occur, this, this horrible, for our family, a horrible, horrible thing to go through. And it was, uh, you know, as, as a mom or as a parent of young children, there are lots of ideas you have in the shower <laughs> because that's the only peace and quiet you have in your day is that couple of minutes in the shower. And I'd had ideas in there for years and um, couldn't do anything about them because as soon as you get out, you know, so-and-so needs a diaper change or somebody needs food or whatever things are going on for your day, your day begins the minute the shower door opens. And this was one of the things that going through this, your mind is racing. When your child is abducted, you don't fall to the floor. You don't start sobbing and, and going out of control. Your mind is thinking, what do I do next? Where do I go? Do I do I run in the street? Do I start? You know, I stay by the window and not move. Do I do I use the phone? Do I not use the phone? Like everything, turns into hyper mode, and so all of your every moment of your thoughts is consumed by this. So in the shower, I had to start putting podcasts so that I could not allow my mind to wander to what could be happening to my child, because that was just too painful. And that's when, as I reached out to the Lord, and I was just like, Lord, what do you want me to do? You've allowed this pain. What do you want me to do with it? And that's when I heard on the podcast that they were looking for missionaries. They didn't have enough to answer all the calls and the emails that were coming in from Iran and Myanmar and all over the world. And that was my answer. You, you paint a very biblical story. Um, it's the story of Joseph. It is the story of Joseph. And Joseph is now estranged from his family, and he proceeds for 25 years. There is a gap between the selling into bondage to the Ishmaelites, throwing into the pit mm -hmm. and being separated from his family. 25 right. years of a father grieving for a dead child not knowing that he was alive to the fulfillment of the dream the vision uh, as he speaks to his brothers and says what the enemy meant for evil the god worked for good so that many would be saved yep. so most people miss this and they become consumed and they become the center and god becomes the peripheral and God is to be the nucleus, and we are to become the ones who surround ourselves with, with Lord, what do you want me to do with this? Yeah. Not, how do I get out of this? All right? Yeah, or why did you allow this? Because he's not going to answer that. First of all, there's evil in the world. There is. There is one who lies, kills, destroys, separates, deceives, does what we are. Look, Job said it best. That which I feared the most has come upon me. Yep. All right. I would think that it would be every parent's greatest fear. Yep. And it's hidden in there at the birth of a child. Uh, yes. And it's covered up. We don't know it. I'm an adoptive parent, and um, 
my story pales in comparison. But I had an extended period of time where the birth mother, because of court issues, instead of there being a three-month window, became a nine-month window yeah. where I could lose my child. Yep. And in nine months, you have this bonding experience, and to think that she could have been literally ripped out of my hands, and that's what it would have taken. I probably would yep. be in prison today. Mm -hmm. should that have happened, but we finally got through the court system to have, the, but I can understand this death, mm -hmm. gri death grip fear. Yes, it's uh, the same fear. It's the same fear. Yeah, and I think people miss that. I think sometimes, you know, when I'm talking with people, they'll say, well, I haven't gone through what you've gone through. I, I know, but we don't have to go through the same things exactly to be in the same place exactly. One person's trial is not less than somebody else's. They really are going through something that to them feels like the end of the world, the hardest thing they've ever gone through. And it doesn't matter whether it's a child that's taken or it's bankruptcy, those both take you to the same place. And so that same fear is the same. How did you make it through this? How, how did you and your, your husband, you're still married. Yes. Your children, you have other children. Yes. How do you get up every day with no news? Mm -hmm. How do you get up every day with the hope mm -hmm. of news? Well, and, you know, I think that's best illustrated in a, a, a story that there was one time, I want to say it was about two, um, two years, I was going to say two months, two years in, where I really just kind of, one night I went to bed and I said, Lord, you know, from the beginning, I have felt like you have told me, our child is coming home. Don't give up hope. Now, he could have told me something different, and it was not a booming voice from heaven, don't give up hope. You, you know when the Lord speaks to your heart, you know. And so... Um, I knew from the beginning he was saying, your child's coming home, don't give up hope. So I had that to hold on to, as opposed to someone who doesn't have that relationship with Christ and isn't given that information. Maybe, you know, even other believers maybe are not given that information, depending on their case. And maybe the answer God says is you let, need to let go. It's not going to happen. I don't know those situations. I only know my own. And so I knew that. And then here it was two years in, and I was like, Lord, like, did I hear you wrong? Is there any chance that in my desire to have my child come home, I have heard you wrong? You know, maybe I was just supposed to do these things and then you were gonna, you know, not let it happen. Like, is there something that I'm missing? Is there some way that I have pushed my own hopes onto you? Please, if that is the case, let me know to let go. And I will let go. It will not be easy, but I will do that if that's what you're asking. Don't let us head in any direction that's not your own. And I went to bed that night praying that. And the next morning, I go to check my email that day. And I get an email from a missionary friend of mine in Greece who said, I just need to let you know that I'm praying for you guys. You know, I'm, I'm here for you. And as I was praying, I felt like the Lord wanted me to tell you not to give up and that your child is coming home. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a, you know, I know God's got good things for you or, right. you know, there, you're opening to the Psalms and it says, you know, the Lord has, you know, has good things. It wasn't something vague. It was like, here is what you prayed and here is your exact answer to the questions you asked. That has happened so many times in the four years that there is no doubt in my mind that my child is coming home. And that is part of how I get up every morning. So the, I want to go back to the imperative your husband came home with that you had to come to faith. It was not, he was relentless. He pursued you. He, he tormented you <laughs> right, until you came to that decision. That was the genesis yes. of all of this because of this. had that not occurred yep. at that point in time, yeah. you would be divorced. 
you oh, would you you would be you would fall into the fate of the highest percentages of those suffering through the PTSD, PTSD, yes. the depression, the loss of a child, all of yes. that. Those things that divide families, uh, the ones where there is the blame, the recrimination, the um, all those things that I can look and hear your story, and I know when your story began. It began in God's relentless pursuit of you. Yes. He would not let you go because unless you had that when you came to this point. Yep. And people don't understand divine appointments and they don't understand divine intervention. Yes. And how transformational this could be the today. Yes. In this story that you tell, which is heart-wrenching, heartbreaking, no one would say that they would trade places with you. Nobody. There, yeah. There's nobody in this world that would say, I'll exchange my life for yours right now. I'm sorry, as, as, as tender as my heart is, <laughs> as compassionate a man as I am, yeah. I, I can't say to you in all honesty, I, yeah. I, I would do that for you. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm not Jesus, <laughs> okay? Jesus would do that for you, but I'm not Jesus. And I, I'm, I'm being real and open, and there's nobody yes. out there in our audience that's going to come running to you and say, okay, I volunteer, I'll do that for you, okay? Right. Um, this is a walk that God has you going through and your family going through, yes. and only for his purposes to be accomplished. And... One of those purposes mm -hmm. is this. Mm -hmm. There wasn't anything like that for us. It didn't exist. No. There was, I mean, we have wonderful, our, our church and our friends and our family came alongside us. We had the support. So I think, you know, having a strong family, having a strong church family, having the support we had allowed us to have that earthly support to continue on. And that's, I think, why we're able to do so much in the situation that we're at, because there are people there who have nothing, who go through a divorce. You know, the, the spouse takes a child and goes over to France. They don't have their children. They don't have a job. They don't have a family support. They have nothing. And that is why that book exists, because I was in a place that God put me so that I could make something that would help people just like us and people way worse than we were going through, going through the same thing, but alone, going through the same thing, but no support, going through the same thing, but not believers and not knowing that God can still be supreme over something this hard. You know, it's so interesting that you would listen to the podcast, that there was a need for missionaries. And this was the foundation that there was a need for missionaries, somebody to be a missionary to the bereaved, to those who are surviving divorce, for those who are parents of missing children, for those who are, are parents of children who are abducted, runaways, uh, placed in foster care, all of these situations and circumstances that God would choose you. Yeah, that's pretty unbelievable. <laughs> that he would use any of us, really. It's it's a shock. I mean, it's when you talk about Joseph, I talk about him in the book, and I, I really just talk about how that, I know what he felt like. I know what it felt like when Job looked at, like I used to read when Job would say, um, you know, though he slay me, still I will praise him. And I would read that and I would think, you know, okay, he's like, you know, though he slay me, so I will praise him. And now I know what Job was doing. Job was on his knees and he was screaming to the enemy, though he slay me, still I will praise him. Like everything in me wants to die, but I know God is good and I know what he's doing is good. And though I don't understand it, though he takes me to the very brink, I will still choose to praise him. And we get to do that. And we get to be Joseph in that prison where years pass and he's like, Lord, but I did everything you asked, but I was here, but I didn't deserve this. 
why are you letting this happen? And God is saying, I will use this for something amazing. We wouldn't have the Jewish people. They would not be here had he not sent Joseph in that. We get to be that. It's an honor. The Lord gives and, and the, the Lord, Lord takes, takes away. away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. I come prepared. <laughs> what you have done is you have created a tool that takes us past the there's people who there's great resources for PTSD there's great resources for suicide recovery there's great root um, uh, compassion international for people who have lost a child and they they meet in the churches and it's a, it's a wonderful gathering and they can tell the stories and they bring the pictures of, of the loss and and it's not biblical there, there's not a big, big, big biblical pattern for the loss of a child. So we find this to be an unbiblical occurrence uh, where we don't have great preparation. Uh, we see two great losses in the same response. Uh, we see Jacob who hears of Joseph and he tears his garment. And we hear God hears of Jesus and he tears his garment. All we know to do is to wrench our rent our clothes, all right, and to fall into uh, sackcloth and ashes and and and, and taken to the to the bottom. But what you've done is you have gone out and talked to some of the leading authorities and put together a compilation that says, you know what, you don't have to know where to go. I've already gone there for you. I talked to uh, Dr. Sue Corbla, Corn Booth, uh, Logan Clark, Dr. Tim Benson, Dr. Rachel Mitch, Michael Jeffries. I've talked to them about depression, PTSD, nutrition, the body's reaction stress, reunification, grief, heartbreak, heartache, how to stay together through it how to find strength in brokenness, how to be broken together, how to live broken together, how to come together when everything says run the other way. And that's what's contained in the pages of this book, Strength for Parents of Missing Children, Surviving Divorce, Abduction, Runaway, and Foster Care by Marie White. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to dig into some of the counsel and advice of things that we, the public, our viewing audience around the world, you in Pakistan right now, you in Thailand right now, you in Brazil right now, you in Norway right now, you in North America right now, you in Canada right now, what can you be doing to be a part of this solution to bring even the reunification of one? Will you be the person that when you get the amber alert on your phone will silence it? Or will you take a hard look at that picture? And will you put that indelibly in your mind? Will you take it, will you print it out and put it on the car seat? When you walk into Walmart, will you have it with you on your buggy so that you, as you're walking through, can say, you know what, that looks like that child. Will you be called to action? Because that's what's calling us to do with this program and with the message of Murray White, and you don't have to just sit back and you can do something. You can play a part in the reunification of a family. We're gonna take a short break and we'll be right back. Back. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Ignatic Nation and host of the daily TV program, Revealing the Truth, seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Igniting Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, we've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, and all across North America. 
All of our authors are featured on the Books and Media page on our website, www.ianbn.com. There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order, and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage, and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial-free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live, four-hour daily Christian television talk show program. The first is through your support and tax-deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the donate button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. The teaching archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, prophecy in the news videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www. Dot ianbn .com. Every day you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go to hear the truth. We are committed to bring you the only program of its kind that covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. Since we launched on January 5, 2017, we have aired over 300 individual teachings, interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day, and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, tools, and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media and through your financial support. We know you have many choices in who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to our teaching archives. Without you, we do not exist. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Marie White, author of Strength for Parents of Missing Children, Surviving Divorce, Abduction, Runaways, and Foster Care. A one-of-a-kind guide, a compendium of resources that Marie has put together that covers the entire spectrum of how to deal with all these issues. You go to a hundred other books and not get what you would get in this one resource. Marie White, welcome back to Revealing the Truth. Booker Tov, Eric. Thank well, you for having me. Uh, but, well, actually, um, uh, we're just a little past morning, but it's morning where you are. So, <laughs> so uh, Boker Tov to you as well, and so good to see you, Marie. Um, Marie, the magnitude of this is staggering to me. Mm -hmm. More than two million families in the United States have experienced a missing child. Yeah. Numerous alienated parents, estranged grandparents foster parents, 
pre-adoptive parents and parents of drug addicted children are currently facing children missing from their lives. Some people break down mentally or suffer from PTSD. Other people become pathologically depressed or turn to drugs or alcohol. Many choose to end their suffering through suicide. You have taken your family's pain and turned it into this guidebook right, that others didn't have. Yeah. And this book was the solo medalist winner of the 2017 New Apple Literary Award and is awarded five stars by readers' favorite yeah. because it is a one-of-a-kind resource for those that are going through this. M Marie, the, there's no words for us to put on um, the anguish and, no. the, and the heartache and the heartbreak. Um, I know that you say your faith is what keeps you going, yeah. but there's something larger, uh, yeah. nothing of course larger than God, but the hope of reunification yeah. is something that is to be celebrated in such an extraordinary way. How often does that occur? Reunification between families? You know, the, the statistics are really hard because recently we just saw last year, in October of last year, there was, um, I can't remember her name right now, but the little baby that was taken from the hospital as a newborn and was reunited at 18 years old. I mean, that's, I mean, who in the world would think 18 years, a baby taken, you can't even, you can't age that, okay? There's no way you're aging a newborn to 18 years old and getting that correct. And yet they were found and the family was reunited. I mean, that is happening all the time. I'm on a number of um, Facebook groups for people with um, parental alienation, which I had no idea was really a thing or it was such a huge thing. The Facebook groups I'm on have up to 40,000 members per group, and I'm not on just one group. These are families where they get a divorce and one parent takes the child either out of country. Um, one of the stories that we talk about in the book, they took them into Brazil, into the middle of a drug cartel. I mean, all these different things where people are like, well, that's, you know, it's the mom or it's the dad. It's like, it's not the same. It's not, it's not cool like that. It's, it's somebody who's mentally unstable doing something wrong to a child that they are biologically linked to. That doesn't make it right. And as Logan talks about, the uh, um, private detective that talks in the book, he talks about going to these countries and rescuing them and talking with authorities and authorities saying, well, but it's the mom. He's like, but the mom is bipolar and schizophrenic and is off of her meds because I'm trapping, tracking her through her meds. And as he's telling them this, another mom with doing that same scenario had killed her children. Like it's, it's so, it's not a lighthearted thing. And statistics are way off because they just aren't reported exactly. We were seeing for a while one parent every day taking their life because they couldn't handle the stress and the emotional distress of not having their child. And that's from having a child who's abducted by someone they know to someone abducted by someone they don't know. The stress is so unbelievable, you really just don't know how you'll survive. Are our law enforcement agencies, the FBI, uh, local law enforcement, are there national registries, are there, we know we get the Amber Alert, mm -hmm. um, but do people really pay attention? Are people really actively engaged? And if, if you came to me and said, Rabbi Eric, there's something you could do on a daily basis that might have a positive impact on one or more of two million families, which multiply that by 2.5, okay? Number mm -hmm. of people in a family average, okay? That's, right. that's now five million, five million people could be positively impacted if you did just one thing differently yeah. every day, would you do that? And I would say, without question, what is it you're asking me to do? And we're asking you that when you get an Amber Alert, okay, will you print out on a piece of paper and keep it in your car the tag number that was just put out on the Amber Alert of the child last seen with Arizona license plate XYZ123, and will you keep it on your car seat so that as you're driving down the road 
and you look and you say, oh, there's an Arizona license plate. Oh my goodness, that's the license plate, and call it in. If I could do that, right, anybody could do that. Yes. Okay? But are we doing that? Are we, as a society, playing an active role? Are we going to these websites that are saying, I want to, I want to make, I want to make a, live a life that makes a difference. Okay. Mm -hmm. Who out there does not want to live a life that makes a difference? Yeah. How about if you're the one that finds the child over a website where it shows the child abducted at age two, but here's what they're going to look like at age four. Here's what they look like at age eight. Here's what they look like at age 10. And a family just moved in across the street and the young boy looks just like that boy. Yep. And you're able to make a phone call, not an accusation, not yeah. calling, just saying, I saw a picture of an aging of a child and that looks like the child across the street. I'm not saying that they're the abducted child. I'm just saying I want to make somebody aware of this Yes. Right? And you do with it what you will. And lo and behold, it becomes that child. Yes. Imagine what your life would be like, what their life would be like, the trickle-down effect of this entire and catching the criminal. Yes. And taking them out of the system yes. and then getting them to turn on the system that they got involved in, which helped them to get an abducted child. There's a whole industry out there. What can we be doing about this, and what are the guidelines you give us for dealing with this? Well, I think even simpler than that, if someone says, that sounds great, but I don't know if I can do it, there's even simpler than that. You can literally be in the store and hear a Code Adam. Now, Code Adam was started by um, John Walsh and his son, Adam Walsh, who was abducted. He's the one, um, John Walsh was the guy that was on America's Most Wanted right. and that started the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. So this is where you want to go. If you, if you do not know about Amber Alert, if you don't have anything popping up already, go to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Type that into your Google, it'll, you know, into your Google bar, it'll take you there, and you'll be able to find out that information and get alerts. But if you're in the store and you hear Code Adam, that means that a child has been missing from their family right then. So before this all happened, I'm already thinking as a mom and my family knew, you know, if I was at the store with my kids and there was a code ad and we stopped everything we did, left the cart right there where it was, and we started looking. Because if you can catch that child before they become a missing child, how much more awesome is that? You all know that feeling of being somewhere with your child at the store and all of a sudden they're behind your leg and you're like, oh, where did they go? Like that feeling never ends for us families. And yet here's an opportunity for you to stop that by stopping what you're doing at the grocery store and realizing I may be 10 minutes late for my meeting, but you know what? That child's gonna be returned today. You know, as you're speaking, um, I'm thinking about human sex trafficking. I'm yes. thinking about how many young people are abducted and or runaways, yeah. um, and I was a runaway. I ran away from home. Uh, my parents came and found me, but I ran away. Uh, I didn't want to live there. I didn't want to be there. And had the right person come along, mm -hmm. he I should have been taken in. I, I, I would have gone, I would have left. Uh, yeah. uh, it was a tough childhood, and I didn't want to be a part of it. I packed my bags, I walked out the door, I left in the middle of the night and walked down the street looking for some escape uh, to go away. Yes. I, I didn't want to be there. Um, and this is in the 60s. So yep. you have no idea with all of the uh, activities of the 60s of what it's turned into today. Uh, so there's so much more. This is so much more widespread but so you have a code atom in a yes. shopping center. Mm -hmm. You have an amber alert, uh, yes. which goes out. You see it on the highways. Uh, yes. And I have an amber alert on my phone. It goes off. It immediately tells me. What other resources are out there? Well, 
Before we move on to the, to the other resources, sure. let me just say something because I know about your connection with Israel. Yes. And I also absolutely love Israel and have been there and need to go back again and, and refilm over there. But there is actually something going on in Israel with missing children. And what's happening over there is that during the time that um, when everybody came back to Israel, when Israel became a nation, yes. so what's that, 67? Yeah, 68. 68, okay, so when Israel became a nation and everyone started well, coming back. Yeah, 1948 is when they became a nation, but... Uh, okay, the, the, yes, 48. Uh, that's 68. What was 68? Was that the Six-Day War? No, that was right was after. Six, okay. We'll forget all these dates. These are not important dates. Right. Erase all that <laughs> in, in your mind, people. Erase your... Um, but when the people came over here, there were a number of families who could not have children, and there were a number of families who could have children. And the big controversy in Israel right now is that there were people who were very poor and went into hospitals, went to have babies, and then the hospital would say, that your baby died. Well, can we see the baby? No. Was there a death record? No. Well, so all of a sudden, there's this, people are wondering if, there's, if something happened where the children were taken and given to other families who wanted to have children. So these children were actually abducted from their families at birth at the hospital and given to families who could afford it. Uh, or who could buy babies is what they're they're saying. Obviously, I don't know the factuality of this, and you have to read the news articles on this, but right now this is really big in Israel, and it pertains to what we're talking about. Um, they have actually found families where uh, someone went in and gave birth to twins. They said one of the twins died. They took that child, gave it to somebody else, and now those twins have been reunited and DNA checked, and it did happen. So this is a worldwide problem, as you talked about during the break. Um, it is not isolated. There are things in each um, in each country. So you really need to look up your country and look up missing children and see if you can find the direct resources. It will not be hard. It will be one of the first or second Google results when you check that in. Um, but go look on that and see what's available for you because there are a number of Facebook groups for missing people um, where you can get alerts that way and they will post the pictures that are on the Amber Alerts and at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, they will repost them onto there. So Facebook groups are really great. You know, as you're talking, you know, I wrote a biblical thriller several years ago <clears throat> called The Codist, still out uh, now, still um, a top seller on the weaponization of DNA. Now, mm. there are 30 million or 300 million, I forget how many DNA records that are out there now uh, that uh, 23andMe uh, just uh, sold or licensed to Smith Klein Beckman to do research on. As we're looking at DNA, uh, we would then be able to match even as an adult. Okay, mm -hmm. so you go into this ancestry.com DNA. Uh, if there was a focus on matching and finding and reuniting through DNA, that would be the perfect, that's exactly how we identify them today, is by DNA matching. Uh, wow. As much as I'm opposed to Jewish, <laughs> Jewish um, DNA testing, because I can only envision if Adolf Hitler had uh, uh, a Yellow Pages directory Right. Of, of every Jewish person in the world based on their right. DNA. Of course, uh, he would have been in there, but that's, that's neither here nor there. Right. <laughs> but he would have gone after all of us, and none right. of us would have survived. None Absolutely. of my family would have survived. None of your family would have survived. Uh, we'd be in this situation. But there, for everything that the enemy would counterfeit, God can use for his good and his glory. So, um, uh, Well, and John Walsh, you know, he went through... Um, a way worse scenario than we're going through, but the same scenario with having a child that's abducted. Now, one, there was no code atom, so it happened in a store, and he could have, if there had been a code atom, they could have found their child like that. Um, and two, there was nothing for him either. There were no resources, there were no Amber Alerts, there were no statewide, you know, sharing of pictures. Like they had nothing. I just heard him talk for the first time this year, and to hear what he went through because even in their one town going to them to try to help him find his child they didn't even have resources or availability to do that they literally one person in the office next to them had no idea what was going on 
Like it was that disorganized. So they did the same thing where they went through something horrific and they decided, you know what? There were no resources for this. Now we're gonna make this happen. We're gonna make sure no other family has to go through this. And that's really what enacts change is one person making a, a difference, starting something that's never been there before. So would you recommend that families um, have a DNA record of their child uh, where, where microchipping pets uh, I'm not into microchipping children, right. um, but I did, um, uh, my daughter was just uh, over to visit, she's 29, we were going through uh, my daughter's box, and in there was a daughter, it was an ID card with her footprints right. um, that I carried with me, yeah. uh, that I had her ID'd and enter, her footprints were entered into a national registry, and this is going back 28 years ago. Yeah. 29 years ago, there was a national registry where you could register your baby's footprints mm -hmm. and get into a national database in case that they were. So even as 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 uh, recently as my parenthood, which is the last 29 years, uh, right. programs have been to, been been developing so yeah. that we can locate in some way or match up should there be uh, uh, an encounter where you're trying to identify. Uh, yeah, have, and have. there are, um, if you go um, type in free child fingerprint kit, there will be um, free kits that you can get. I know Old Navy does once a year where they have these kits available at their stores. Um, I believe I'm missing Child's Day, which I think is in May. You'd think I'd know these things, but there are a lot of days that are, right. <laughs> that are important. Um, but um, Old Navy does co does combine with law enforcement and does do a missing child's day, and they um, have the free fingerprint kits there. You can go to any Old Navy in the U.S., and they will have the kits there free for free. Most police departments will have something like that, and online you can usually order a free fingerprint kit, where then you can fingerprint your children, have a good picture of them, make sure you take a good picture with your phone or whatever, so that you always have something up to date. Because if something were to happen to your child today, do you have something more recent than a picture from a year ago, which is a family picture? It doesn't look like that anymore. Do you have something more recent that you could then show authorities? And so the fingerprinting and the picture are great. You know, it takes you to that question, what were they last seen wearing? And, yes. you know, what shoes did they have on? What color socks? Yes. What color pants? What color shirt? I don't remember. Did they have a bow there? I don't remember. Uh, it's important for us to become aware. Uh, yes. much more aware, not because we're going to walk in fear, but we're going to walk in faith, but we also are to be uh, as wise uh, and prepared for yeah. what the enemy has because nothing will separate you more than uh, this, this tragic situation, which is not tragic because it's ended, it's tragic because it happened. Uh, the, the rejoicing that's going to come, and I'm believing with you that it's going to come, is a day like we have never seen uh, the jubilation that will take place. Uh, for those parents that are out there right now who are going through this, for those that have allowed uh, the loss of a child uh, the separation of a child, the abduction of a child, to cause them to uh, go into a downward spiral, spiral to go into divorce, to lose um, uh, what you would consider the sanity, uh, yeah. that they've become unstable, they are suffering with anxiety. Strength for parents of missing children, surviving divorce, abduction, runaways, and foster care is a compilation of resources of professionals and Marie's own story uh, along with her husband uh, without a lot of the details because this is an ongoing investigation. This is an ongoing situation. So we ask that you be sensitive, that you don't email her and say, where are you and what are you doing and tell me the details of this. Uh, that is between her and the law enforcement uh, entities that she is working with. But uh, we would encourage you to visit her website, uh, to uh, connect with her and the organizations that she is a part of, uh, for you to get the book. 
uh, and use, utilize the resources that are in here and to become aware that two million families in the United States have experienced a missing child. This is mind-boggling. When, when I read this statistic, it, 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 I was undone by it. It took me to tears to think about the heartache of two million families. This is just beyond our comprehension. And with all this political footballing back and forth over issues that are not as heart crushing as these issues, we as a nation need to get it together. We need to yeah. open our eyes. We need to major on the majors. And we need to start taking care of our children and watching out for other people's children and start being good citizens of this nation. And if you're a believer, and 72% of you out there in the United States identify yourself as a Christian, start acting like one. Open your eyes and ears and listen to conversations. Look for things that don't fit. Open your eyes and look for what doesn't look right. When you pull into ga for gas in that truck stop, take a look at what's going on over at the diesel pump. Take a look at what's going on over there that doesn't look right, because that's where human sex trafficking has taken place. Right? And there's a whole world out there that you need to open your eyes to, not because you want to be sullied and soiled, but wouldn't you like to be the one to pick up the phone and call Marie White and say, we found your child and I played a part in that. You can make a difference in the life of a family. This is a starting point for you if you're going through it. This is a starting point for you if you want to make a difference. This is a starting point for you to help two million families get through this. And if you're one of those families, our heart here at Igniting a Nation goes out to you and we will pray for you. Marie White, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord Thank make you. his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his countenance toward you and reveal to you where your child is and reunite them even as we speak right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. We'll send you the link Thank to this. You. Let's get it out there. Everybody, Marie White, Strength for Parents of Missing Children, Surviving Divorce, Abduction, Runaways, and Foster Care. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you. We're going to take a short break, and when we return, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth. <laughs>